Christopher, thank you for joining me today. I'd like to start by asking you to tell me about your background and how you came to be in your current role. Okay. Um, originally, I got into the uh, medical field, you might say, through uh, veterinary medicine, although I actually grew up in the pharmaceutical industry. My uh, family owned a uh, wholesale pharmaceutical company, so I was familiar with how things worked there. Um, I then went into public health and uh, later uh, went to law school. After that, uh, I replaced a, uh, a lawyer with a science background here at the Tufts Center for the Study of Drug Development. That was yeah. about 15 years ago, so I've been working here uh, ever since. Okay, and how would you summarize the key changes you've seen in drug development for pharma over the last 20 years or so? Yeah, uh, well, that takes a lot of uh, a lot of summarizing, but uh, <laughs> Not an easy I think basically we're coming down to uh, perhaps the fruition, if you will, of stratified medicine, which I think started really, if you look way back there in the 80s, with uh, orphan drugs and uh, where there were these smaller populations, uh, but the drugs were, uh, although expensive uh, to some degree. They were considered to be uh, cost-effective because they prevented a lot of uh, loss of uh, worker productivity, quality of life uh, problems, et cetera, et cetera. I think they're coming to that realization now where we're, we're, re we're getting away from the so-called um, drugs that address large populations, 15 or 20 million, down to ones that address thousands, hundreds, maybe tens of thousands. Um, and, uh, of course, there are changes, a lot of changes that go along with that. And we're also getting to the point, uh, sort of the higher level of that with personalized medicines, that we're able to then uh, go from being able to subdivide patient populations into strata to actually going to identifying the likely um, utility of a particular drug for a particular patient, so-called personalized medicine. Um, that's one big change. The other one that goes along with that to some degree and has driven it is the emphasis on value because uh, who pays for what drugs has changed. Um, it's, uh, it used to be two-thirds of drugs often in, most, in a lot of countries were, were paid for privately. Uh, now, even in the United States, we're getting to the point where 40, 50 percent of uh, drugs are paid for by the government. Uh, and generally speaking, very few drugs are paid for by third, by uh, by individual payers, but by third-party payers. So uh, your employer, uh, your uh, healthcare organization, the government, whatever. So obviously, there's an emphasis on value um, for the group as a whole. Um, so that's again, that's changed the. Uh, <coughs> Uh, change the view, if you will, of, uh, of what drugs are selected for treatment and uh, what ones are put on formularies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the last one is, is how we go about the process of uh, research and development, R&D. Uh, there's been a paradigm shift there. For example, uh, they say uh, other people have looked at, at the pipelines and said they're really uh, only about 20% of the pipeline now is in the hands of big pharma, you might say, the big companies, and there are some big biotechs as well. Um, the other 80% is spread out over, over many, many companies. We've been doing a couple of projects that seem to emphasize that. One, we're looking at collaborations uh, with academia by industry just in 2008 to 2010, and we find that just in 20 states here in the United States in the medical schools, Almost 500 companies are involved with uh, academic uh, industry collaborations. Similarly, just looking at approvals to, by the FDA for the really newest of the new drugs. Uh, so there's about 20 or so, 25 of those per year. Um, over the last five years, there have been 75 companies that have had one of those approvals. Um, so again, it's spread, it's spread out much more um, in much more of a diffuse and disparate manner than it used to be, and that's probably a good thing in the long run. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, what do you consider to be the biggest challenge or risks facing innovation in drug development right now? 
Well, obviously they're related to uh, what I was just speaking about, uh, but uh, the one is the, the funding environment, obviously. Okay. There's been uh, issues of late related to this second half of, uh, of the, the first decade of the of 21st century, and it's likely to continue for a while in terms of uh, available funding. The big companies, to some degree, are sitting on some cash, uh, not uh, knowing exactly where to go next, you might say, like many of the big companies are, not only in the drug field, but other other fields. Um, there is a problem with uh, venture capital uh, and some temerity there to invest in um, in some of the projects that they were investing in earlier in the decade. So that, that means that things are a little bit lean right now, at the same time that, again, we're realizing that we have to change the kinds of targets that we're going for in terms of the types of products. Uh, again, going for these more stratified patient populations, also for these, uh, we've learned a lot about um, biological mechanisms, disease, pathophysiology, and now the more you learn, the more questions you have, the more issues you have to resolve. So we're, we're dealing with that. And again, we're also adapting to this new paradigm change, more of an open science um, approach, which means that there's a lot less control on the part of um, the big pharma companies. Uh, there are more players involved. There are more issues to dealing with uh, the data and the different cultures within the organizations that are now involved in R&D. So um, these are all lead to a certain amount of chaos, uh, which, again, a lot of times creativity uh, involves a certain amount of chaos. So I think um, there's a lot of changes that are going on that I think will be smoothed out in ensuing years. And, um, again, we look forward, I think, to a period of uh, increasing productivity over the next decade. Okay, great. And uh, what impact do you see the Transparency Initiative having on collaboration and drug delivery? Uh, well, if you um, answer the question in uh, the most uh, um, honest terms, uh, I, I can't say that I see much of anything uh, happening from it now except a lot of back and forth as to what people uh, think will happen. Um, the, you know, the transparency right now, uh, as much as it's happened at all, uh, has been uh, what's been put forward seems to be more about making uh, the information that's coming into the FDA more transparent to the public. Um, there isn't a lot going on right now with uh, concrete um, examples that I've seen of it going the other way in terms of uh, FDA um, really uh, exposing itself, you might say, to uh, uh, the scrutiny of the public. Um, I think that will probably happen because, again, there has to be some give and take on this transparency uh, initiative. There will, again, add to this open science uh, type of, uh, of arrangement now that, that's uh, going along with the new paradigm. So there will be more information out there, hopefully more information that will be useful, I think, we're in danger a little bit, as we are experiencing already, with a little bit of information overload. Uh, and who has the information and what they're doing with, with it and how they're using it, um, whether they're using it effectively or just for their own, uh, their own purposes. Again, we're probably not going back, uh, so we have to just sort of push forward. And I think that uh, informatics will become very important, as it has already in translational medicine. And it will be uh, just managing the information um, that comes out of this transparency project. Our transparency initiative will be also important. And if, in fact, it becomes a two-way street where FDA really begins to talk about how they make decisions, why they make certain decisions, why there are some apparent differences when decisions look like they should be made in a similar fashion and they are not. So a lot can be learned. But again, uh, again there's this certain sort of... Uh, atmosphere of a little bit of, of chaos right now that, that hopefully there will be some, uh, some concrete uh, structure that will come out of it in, in the way things are done between the agencies, uh, between the agency and, and its constituents. 
Okay, and uh, what impact do you see the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act and the Health Care and Education Reconciliation Act having in the long term for pharma and biotech? Yeah, again, hard to uh, put a finger on it. Um, for one thing, in the United States, uh, we have uh, issues, if you will, in terms of everyone uh, being on the same page and kind of jumping on that particular uh, ship or wagon or however, however you want to categorize it in terms of, uh, yes, they've passed a law at the federal level, but the states uh, are... Uh, having different reactions to it. Some are embracing it and passing their own uh, commensurate uh, laws and, and programs. Others are fighting it. So it's going to be a while before this all uh, sort of uh, straightens itself out. Um, in the aggregate, though, I think there are probably, it's probably good for research. There were some programs uh, that were put together um, in the legislation, like the Cures Acceleration Network, um, and some other things that were uh, had pre-existed um, the legislation to some degree, but I think are getting a boost from it. So there is some anticipation that in certain areas uh, there will be a boost to R&D. Um, as far as biosimilars and the trade-off in terms of the market exclusivity uh, trade-off, uh, it's hard to say. It seems like people are mostly predicting a muted impact over the first five years in terms of uh, biosimilars until they work out exactly what the tiering process is going to involve. Obviously, you can't just allow uh, biosimilars uh, out onto the market with the same uh, sort of uh, regime that you had for uh, small molecule generics. It's going to take, uh, I think, more, uh, more of a complex process there. Uh, the other big one probably is in terms of value and the, uh, the comparative effectiveness research initiative that is uh, ingrained in um, the PPACA and, and the attendant legislation. I think we're going to see that that's going to push forward the whole emphasis on uh, comparative effectiveness to some degree also. Even though they have tried to avoid it on cost effectiveness, and uh, the company's going to have to respond, I think, with uh, doing um, more comparative effectiveness research for market positioning. They're going to have to also, I think, make more risk-sharing deals as well as, uh, again, just uh, finding new ways uh, to prove the value to third-party payers. Yeah. Okay, and finally, what impact have REMs had in the U.S.? And as a result, what impact do you see this having on the markets, on other markets such as Europe? Yeah, well, most immediately, uh, the REMs uh, in the U.S. have uh, there have been complaints, uh, mm -hmm. several complaints. One is that they they emphasize uh, risk much more than benefit. This has been scaring patients. It's been confusing for the different people involved in the process uh, to deal with the physician groups, the um, pharmacist groups have complained about it. Um, so they have a lot of things to work on uh, to get REMS to have the benefit and risk management that they had intended. In the meantime, it's, it's kind of mucking up the process, you might say, a bit. Um, it also gives the advisory committees just one more thing to look at that they can have concerns about. Um, and again, if all of this happens late in the uh, approval development process, that can really be deleterious to getting um, products out on the market. So they have to certainly uh, improve and streamline that process. Um, on the other hand, once it's out on the market, um, some of these REMS programs can be quite expensive in terms of managing them over the life cycle of the drug. And uh, that's adding to uh, the so-called regulatory burden and costs for drug development. And there may be certain areas, for example, the opioids, where they're going to start to, companies may start to think, well, these are really a tough go. Uh, mm -hmm. And there are so few things that we can effectively deal, that deal with pain. If you start to get companies shying away from opioids and some other uh, difficult to deal with drugs, 
uh, once they're out on the market, that, that could be a concern. They're going to have to look at this, monitor this very carefully over the next few years. What does it mean for Europe? Well, you know, there is a tendency when one of the big agencies passes some sort of new program for the other agencies to then see if they measure up. Yeah. Um, certainly, uh, Europe may look at the REMS program and decide that they need to ratchet up um, their risk management programs, or they may decide the opposite. They may, they may think, well, we don't think they're getting a lot out of that REMS program that's different from what we're getting or good or better. Uh, than what we're getting out of our risk management program, so we're just going to stand pat. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a close call as to which way it's going to go. Great. Well, Christopher, thank you very much for your time. PharmaForum.com is the dynamic online information and discussion portal for the pharmaceutical industry.